How many of you don't really repent? You don't really ever talk to God about your sin. You may complain to him about other people's sin, but you don't repent of your sin. Or how many of you don't repent well to others? You don't just go to them and say, I am sorry, it was wrong. Please forgive me. Let me say that that is so powerful. It starts when you're young. Parents, model this for your children. Your parent, you parents should never have a culture in your household where your children never hear you repent of your sin because they'll just grow up to be religious kids who talk about everybody else's sin but not their own because they will have learned that from their mom and dad. Dads, you want to know how to be the spiritual leader of your home? Repent. When you're wrong, tell the kids, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. It's powerful. Because sin leads to death. It kills marriages. It kills families. It kills friendships. It kills community groups. It kills churches. So the sin will either kill the relationships or Jesus' death will allow the sin to be put to death so that the relationship between God and the person and God and other people can continue. I tell you, I had two of the more encouraging conversations of recent memory in this past week. And I won't divulge all the details, but it was two people who had sinned. They had sinned. And one person understood that they were sinning against their spouse in a way that was not yet devastating, but was escalating. And people who loved them brought conviction from the Holy Spirit and started talking to him about it, confession. And there was contrition on their behalf. Oh, you're right. Look what I'm doing. This is really dangerous. And they changed in the grace of God. So I, I, I got to call him this week. How are you doing? Good. Jesus has forgiven me. My spouse has forgiven me. Our community group has forgiven me. And I'm grieved by where I was, but I'm so glad for where we're going. And there's hope. And I'm not alone because I'm loved. Isn't that wonderful? Another person I met with this week, there's sin in their life sat down, had a meal with him, looked him in the eye. Okay, I love you very much. I have a few hard words. I don't know how you're going to take them. Here's what I see. This person responded very humbly, um, very kindly. And at one point they said, thank you. And in the midst of the conversation, they basically said in their own words, I want to be like Jesus, so thank you for helping me be more like him. I started crying. They started crying. Two guys at breakfast, publicly. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay, there's, there's a conviction there. And they say, I want to repent. Praise God. So when we're done, it was, it was actually a deeper friendship. You know why? Jesus died, so the friendship didn't have to. They even gave me a hug. I'm not a big hugger but I got a hug. <laughs> you know that Jesus was involved when sin ends in a hug, right? You know that Jesus was involved. And so when Jesus says, go out and preach repentance, he's inviting people to experience a whole new way of life. And if you're struggling in your relationship today, the answer is Jesus. The problem is sin. The answer is Jesus. And confessing it means talking about it with Jesus and the person you're having the strife with. You confessing your sin, them confessing their sin, praying for one another, and Jesus will show up and heal your relationship. And this is repentance. And repentance is essentially what it means to be a Christian. Uh, the Protestant Reformation was kicked off with basically a manifesto called the 95 Theses that was penned by Martin Luther, and it was nailed to this door at a place called Wittenberg. And it began this manifesto with this statement, all of a Christian's life is one of repentance. 
You repent of sin to become a Christian. You repent of sin to grow as a Christian. You repent of sin to reveal Christ to others. All of a Christian's life is one of repentance. The prophets keep saying, repent, repent, repent. And repentance is three things. It's confession, it's contrition, and it's change. That's ultimately what it is. Confession includes your mind and your mouth. When you become a Christian and you're being renewed by the Holy Spirit and you're studying the Word of God, the way you think about yourself and your sin starts to change. That's why the Bible says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You think differently. So it begins with confession saying, I see where I've sinned. I see it. My mind thinks differently about my behavior. Some of you used to do things that you used to brag about or boast about, and now you're ashamed of. Right? That's confession that comes out of conviction. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin so that we might confess sin. Jesus said in John's gospel, he'd send the Holy Spirit, and part of his ministry would be to convict us of sin. I know that the Holy Spirit will give to each of us, myself included, something, some issue, some instance, some relationship. And he will bring that to the forefront of our mind. And he will be compelling and propelling us to deal with that. What is that for you? Don't check your phone. Don't say, boy, I really hope this sermon ends soon. Don't start thinking about all the people who need to hear this. (laughs) Hear it. Acknowledge that, identify that, allow God to do a work in your life today. And it proceeds, repentance does, from confession to contrition. Confession is your mind and your mouth. Contrition is ultimately inclusive of your emotions and your expressions. Somebody who is really contrite, they not only know categorically that they have done wrong, but they feel emotionally that they've done wrong. You feel it. Have you ever seen someone apologize, and you could just tell they're sincere, they mean it, they're contrite, this really bothers them. I don't need to shame them, pile on, or push them. They're already there. I need to love them, forgive them. I don't need to in any way make them feel this because they they already feel it. It's your emotions and your expressions. That's contrition. For those of you who are parents, you can help develop your children in relationships by when they sin, name the sin. Don't just say, you sin. Tell, okay, here's what you said or did or didn't say or do. Here's what it was. Now, I want you to go to that person and I want you to look them in the eye because friendship is all about face-to-face and I want you to tell them you're sorry and I want you to ask them to forgive you for the specific sin. Otherwise, what happens when your kids are like, your sin, say you're sorry. Sorry, they're not. But I tell you, you put two kids together, you make them look one another in the eye. I'm sorry, I sinned, here's what I did, please forgive me. Then there's the awkward silence and the other one says, I forgive you. The emotions and the expressions change. Because when you're looking someone in the eye and you see that you've hurt them, it affects your heart. You realize, man, sin is not just breaking of God's law, it's also breaking God's heart and it's breaking the heart of others. So it is conviction, it is contrition, and it is change. And change, that's your will and your works. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you say, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to say that anymore. I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to be like Jesus. I want to get beyond this. I want this to to die since Jesus died for it. I want to put it to death. And ultimately, by the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you change. You stop doing that. You stop being like that. Maybe it's all at once and it's radical. Maybe you have some failures along the way, but you repent and come clean and you seek the help that you need and you confess it to your spouse and you ask for prayer. And by the grace of God, you do change. And friends, this is the key to all relationships, but particularly Christian marriage. Gary Thomas, he's a good Christian author. He says, Couples don't fall out of love so much as they fall out of repentance. 
You want to have a good friendship? You want to have a long relationship? You want to have a marriage that is enduring and endearing? You want to celebrate your 50th wedding anniversary holding hands? Repent, repent, repent. So that sin is no longer between you, but Jesus is. And couples will say, well, you know, we've fallen out of love. No, you've fallen out of repentance. Because it is, it is difficult to remain loving, trusting, and intimate when you or they are unrepentant. But when you're both repentant, the love flows freely and the trust grows daily. Jesus is the Son of God. The angel declares it. God the Father declares it. Satan even knows it. And Jesus on trial from a bloodied mouth proclaims it knowing it will result in his own murder. And those who originally heard the language of Jesus as the Son of God, they didn't hear it the way the Mormons do. They didn't hear it the way the Muslims do. They heard it as God intended. He is claiming to be equal with God the Father. He is claiming to be the creator of heaven and earth. He is, he is declaring himself to be Lord over all and not just the best among us, but in a category unto himself. He's saying he's God. And if that's not true, that's blasphemy. And the penalty is death. And we see this in another place in the Gospel of John chapter 5 where Jesus makes this same claim that he is the son of God. And they hear that as a claim to deity. So John 5, 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal with God. Friends, that's why Jesus was arrested. That's why Jesus was blindfolded. That's why Jesus was beaten. That's why Jesus was blasphemed. That's why Jesus was hated. That's why Jesus was crucified. And they took Jesus and they beat him some more. They scourged him, ripping the flesh off his back. He was marred beyond human likeness. They made him force forcefully carry a heavy Roman crossbar on his barren, bloodied, traumatized back. He fell on his face and it crushed his chest. He had to have help to carry that crossbar to his place of execution and crucifixion. And they laid him down and they drove the equivalent of railroad spikes through the most sensitive nerve centers on the human body, the hands and the feet. And they killed him openly, publicly, and shamefully in the presence of his own mother as people cursed at him and jeered at him and spat upon him. And friends, let me say this. If he was lying, you have to explain to me why. All he had to do was recant. I'm not God. And his life was spared. And he died. And to ensure he was dead, they ran a spear underneath his side, puncturing his heart sack underneath his rib cage so that water and blood, the inner and outer sacks of the heart, flowed from his side. They buried him in upwards of a hundred pounds of burial linens and spices and they put him in a cold tomb hewn out of rock and they rolled an enormous stone over it to ensure that there was no tampering with the body and they placed the seal of the Roman government upon it to defend and protect it. They posted guards to observe it and Jesus was dead. And he died for our sins. Three days later, on a Sunday morning, he rose from death. Essentially declaring, I told you, I'm God. And he conquered sin and death. 